Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 7, Episode 11, The Rye. Hello everyone, I hope everyone's doing well. I'm not going to lie, I'm coming in a little hot right now. I um, am doing an early morning record. It's 7.30 in the morning here and I just, it was stupid, but I got so irritated about the smallest thing. <laughs> um, is it even worth telling you guys? Uh, whatever. It's just like my husband threw out this little like box that I would keep my protein bars in. It's just like I do the thing where like I empty it out into like this other little box and it's another cardboard box, like whatever. It's just my way of organizing because we have like a bunch of kind bars, all the stuff my husband likes to have for his different sports that he does, like energy chews, all that stuff. So it's like one section of my pantry and I've been keeping my protein bars in the same box in like, and it couldn't be further tucked into a corner, bothering no one. And then this morning, I go and see that that box is gone. And I remember seeing it on the counter a few days ago. And I was like, oh, that's weird. I don't know why it's out. So I asked my husband, I'm like, did you did you throw away that box? He's like, yeah, it was empty. And I was like, uh, well, because my protein bars, for whatever reason, was so, were sold out for uh, like a week or so. So I didn't. He's like, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I just I figured it was empty. So I just throw it out. It's like, that doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> and I might edit this out because this is kind of ridiculous. But I kind of need to vent because I'm like, I'm literally like hot, like I'm hot right now. <laughs> because <laughs> this was so irritating to me. Because the pantry is is my area. Like my husband doesn't cook. The kitchen organization really like he has no business trying to even attempt to figure this out because especially the pantry, I am always the one cleaning out the old crap, cleaning out the stuff that has been sitting there. And to be fair, a lot of the shit that sits there forever are the things my husband buys and then doesn't eat. So I mean, I'm not even get started on the stacks and stacks of different junk foods that this man buys and just leaves in there. He like, oh, it looks good at the grocery store. So he picks it up. Or the stuff that's like, you know, there's like an inch of it bought at the bottom of a, of a bag or whatever of chips, like he just leaves that in there forever. So I'm always the one doing that. This little box, like, and I'm talking, it was like an eight by 10 little, like shallow cardboard box that I kept my protein bars in. Yeah, that was empty for like a week because it, it was sold out at Target where I get them. For whatever reason, tucked into the corner of the pantry was was something he needed to throw away. <sighs> anyway, um, see, 16 years of marriage, these are the things that get on your nerves. <laughs> sometimes. And are you thinking, oh, he might listen to this and whatever. No, he won't. He won't. He tried. He's not a podcast guy, as he keeps saying. Um, he doesn't just like to, I don't like to hear people like talking and talking. And I'm like, okay, all right, fine, fair. Doesn't matter. It's your wife's podcast. And it's about one of your favorite shows and favorite characters too. But no, 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 you're not a podcast guy. I get it. I mean, it should be noted that when I first started dating my husband, he played in a like a heavy, heavy rock band. And I think you guys know, for those of you who, who who know me through this podcast, I'm a new wave girl. Like I'm loving my new orders, my erasures, my Depeche Modes, which ooh, I'm going to get to that later. But yet I supported his band. It wasn't my thing. Okay, I'm going to stop now. I want to be in a good mood because... I have the Depeche Mode concert tonight. I'm so, so, so excited. Uh, we are going with a couple other um, couples in our neighborhood. We rented like a party van to go in. Yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it right. <laughs> we're going to go to dinner beforehand. And then we got some VIP seats. Like I don't, I don't fuck around when it comes to a Depeche Mode concert. I've lost count. I think this is my 12th or 13th show. I have not missed a tour since... 1993. And something I figured out because I was like, wait a second, it's November of 2023. And I'm going to, I think I might be going pretty close to like a 30 year 
on the day anniversary. And it is pretty close. It's a week apart. But my very first Depeche Mode concert was November 23rd, 1993 at the Palace of Auburn Hills in Auburn Hills, Michigan. And so I just think it's pretty cool that on November 16th, I am going to a Depeche Mode concert a week shy of 30 years later. And I don't know. I just thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so that's something to be excited about. I need to let this uh, box shit go. <laughs> I I can like I can see everyone out there going like, why is she getting so upset about this? And if you if some of you out there are intuitive to know, okay, this is not just about the box. You would be right. I love my husband. We are happily married, but it doesn't mean that little shit like this won't send you into a rage sometimes. There's a line in a movie, I think it's Crazy Stupid Love, where there's the line that says, I can love you and hate you in the same day. And only married people will get that. And um, (laughs) and that's very true. I think I saw that movie when I was like, semi newlywed. And I was like, "Mm, that's really mean. But here I am 16 years into a marriage. And I've, I get that quite often. And I'm sure my husband feels the same way about me. I'm sure there are a thousand things that I do every day that gets on his nerves. But hey, man, that's marriage. You deal with it. You move on. I love my husband very much, even though I can't be bothered to listen to this podcast. Okay. Anyway, speaking of this podcast, exciting week. We are at the hot and heavy episode, the namesake episode. I'm so excited. I just, when I first started this podcast, I was like, I can't wait till I get to this episode because I can say, hey, this is what the this is what the podcast is named after. I don't know why I have to say it like this, but I'm saying it like this. When it came to naming this podcast, I was, you know, really insistent. I'm like, I want it to be something Elaine says. You know, I want it to be something that comes out of her mouth first. And of course, Spongeworthy came to mind. In fact, the earliest iteration of this podcast. I was uh, going to do it with a couple of good friends of mine from uh, back in Michigan, some improv buds who are huge Elaine fans, huge Seinfeld fans. But it was just really hard. I mean, now I think I could manage it because I have some more experience with how to record and all the you know ins and outs of, of editing and all this stuff. And plus, Zoom wasn't a thing when we were talking about this podcast. We were talking about it in 2017. And so I was like, how the hell do you do like remote podcasting? And, and also, you know, co-hosts, that poses another challenge of sticking to a schedule and making sure people have availability. And so anyway, in the most earliest iteration, we had come up with a name, me and my two co-hosts, of a most sponge-worthy podcast, which I loved. I thought that was so clever and I loved it. But then when it came to time for me to just, you know, I said, I'm doing this by myself, no matter what, I've been thinking about it for years. Um, It's the pandemic. I need something to get this creative outlet going. And so... I thought about using that, but then also there's also another podcast out there called, I can't remember the exact name, but it, it's got Sponge Worthy in there. And then the more I thought about it, I'm like, it's pretty obvious. Like that's that's the easiest. That's the low hanging fruit, if you will, even though it's still a great name for a podcast, a Sponge Worthy podcast. So I went on the search for other things and hot and heavy. I just love the alliteration of it. I had to get over the fact that I'm like, well, it's originally Jerry who says it. But it's in reference to Elaine. I was like, good enough. In fact, you know, that's the thing. Well, I guess it's not the thing you remember from this episode. It's probably the rye bread. (laughs) But, um, you know, for me, I I love it. And I I love the way it's incorporated into the episode. I think it's (laughs) such a weird, it's like, it's, I know it's a term, but it's just like, I think it encapsulates the the tone of these friends I don't know like they would say hot and heavy it's just very uh, identifiable to their age group this time so that's why I said okay hot and heavy I think is good and then I tacked on the Elaine Bennis podcast after this because in all my research I did before I started this podcast they say you want it to be searchable so if it was just hot and heavy 
people might not understand what it's about. And plus, there were other hot and heavy podcasts, and they were they were about like body positivity, you know. Um, so it was it was stuff that really had nothing to do with obviously Elaine Bennis. So I tacked on the the Elaine Bennis podcast portion of it, so that if someone was just searching up an Elaine Bennis podcast, hot and heavy would come up on the list. And so that was what I learned. I know it's a long name, but I'm fine with it. My justification was Conan O'Brien's podcast is called Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. That's kind of long, right? So I was like, hot and heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. And at this point, it rolls off the tongue. All right, so let's get into the rye. The synopsis for the rye is as follows. George tries to secretly replace a rye bread his parents took back after a dinner with Susan's parents. Jerry is forced to steal a rye bread from an old lady in order to carry out George's plan. Kramer gives Susan's parents a ride on a friend's handsome cab, but the horse becomes flatulent after eating too much beefarino. Elaine dates a saxophonist, hoping his musician lips will be well suited for her sexual pleasures. <laughs> This episode was written by Carol Leifer. Okay, first, yay! Female writer Carol Leifer, super funny. I'm so excited that she wrote this episode and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I usually give shit to whoever writes these synopses because they're usually somewhat inaccurate. And this one's sort of inaccurate because I don't think Elaine's dating a saxophonist in order for his lips to be well suited for her sexual pleasures. But I, I think she's just dating him because she likes him. But that phrasing, how uh, hilarious is that? I just was like, wow, okay, now I give credit to the to the synopsis writer because that really delighted me. All right, we start out in a jazz bar called Bradley's. Elaine is watching her boyfriend play saxophone on stage, and we hear her voiceover as she's watching. She's saying she cannot believe she's going out with him. He's so cool. Oh, maybe he'll write a song about me. Oh, Elaine. And she kind of does this impression of what he'd say to her about how beautiful she is and her personality, too. It's so wonderful. And her fantasy gets to the point where she could quit her job and never work again. The song ends and everyone starts clapping. Elaine sort of snaps out of her fantasy and starts clapping as well. And uh, her boyfriend gives her a little wave from the stage. My take, uh, this is a cute first scene. Uh, I like that there's no stand-up to open the episode. I think we need to phase those out at this point. I think I think they're on their way to do that. But every now and then we still see it. And to have Elaine solo in the opening scene is very delightful. She opens the episode. And so we learn about her new relationship right away. We know exactly what's going on. I I like that we have voiceover. I always like those because of the expressions that the actors have to give. Jason Alexander said once in the commentary um, about how that was a really tough thing to do for them. Like, you never knew what to do with your face. But I think all of them nail it every time this happens. Anyway, while I love that there's voiceover, I just think the dialogue is really meh. Like, it's not funny at all. <laughs> oh, Elaine, you're so, so beautiful. And your personality is so wonderful. It's like, really? I just feel like they could have given her something way better and actually funny. So John Germain is the boyfriend. He's, how would I describe him? He's very 90s sexy, I guess you could say, especially since in the 90s around this time. Well, this was 95. I feel like it might have been moving out of this, but definitely early 90s. That was prime time for saxophone players to be like puss magnets, like like rock stars. We got Kenny G. There was this saxophonist, Dave Cause, who I'll talk about a little bit more later when I get to the extras. Also, the saxophone was like prevalent in songs back then. It was just like there would be like a sax break in like a normal pop song. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty impressive. Elaine is pulling like a hot commodity here. Also, I was thinking about this. If she were to date a musician, I think it makes sense Elaine would date someone in this genre. Like I can't really see <laughs> Elaine dating like a rock and roll musician or a hip hop guy. So I think a musician for Elaine, it makes sense that it would be this type of musician. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Elaine is telling Jerry that he has to come see John perform. He's incredible. Jerry says, well, maybe he'll write a song about you. <laughs> Elaine's like, yeah, okay, like that matters. <laughs> Acts like she hasn't just been fantasizing about that. 
So Jerry takes it that he's sponge worthy. Oh, yeah. Well, he's a musician. They're supposed to be very uninhibited and free. Helene's like, yeah, well, actually, he's not like that at all. Jerry's surprised. Helene starts to tell him something, but then she stops. Jerry's like, oh, come on. I don't want to. <laughs> he's like, you're amongst friends. Fine. So she tells him that he doesn't like to do everything. Oh, okay. Jerry asks, does that bother you? No, no, she says. I mean, it would be nice. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it wouldn't be nice. Why not? You're there. Exactly. Jerry points out, well, didn't you say he was coming out of a serious relationship? Maybe he's still kind of... Elaine's just shaking her head. Eh, It's not going to happen. Kramer enters. He needs Jerry's help to get a bunch of (laughs) groceries from his car. Uh, He loaded up at the Price Club, apparently. My take on this scene, I really like the conversation between Jerry and Elaine about the John Germain stuff here. Like, this is very Seinfeld. This is what we love about the show, talking about relationships. Her hesitation at first is so funny. I love it. I love that. I don't wanna. (laughs) Now, in the inside look, JLD mentions how great the writing was. All we had to say was, he doesn't do everything. And she's like, and then it's so obvious we're talking about oral sex. Well, I just have to point out here. (laughs) I'm sure it was obvious to most folks. But at this point, the date of this episode airing, I was 17. Very virginal. I had no clue what they were talking about. Back then, I would just like if something went over my head sexually, like especially something really specific and everyone's like, oh, okay, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like I just knew like, all right, this is something I don't get. Uh, I would just kind of apply a general sex act. I didn't even know. I, I just I just added that to the things I didn't understand. But whatever. I still enjoy the episode. Honestly, I'm not even sure that I knew that cunnilingus existed back then. Yes, I was 17, but I was so clueless. And I hung out with, I don't know, I was going to say good girls, but that implies if you were sexually active at that age, you were a bad girl. That is totally not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I hung out with similarly um, virginal girls. We all had this sim- a similar amount of experience. And then it hit me too that <laughs> this is now the second storyline in Seinfeld that revolves around going down on a woman. I mean, it's pretty amazing they got away with this on a network sitcom. And just something personal about me. I don't know if you need to know this, but you know, I feel so I feel so close to you guys. You guys know me. Um, and if this is your first episode, well, welcome to my TMI segment. I guess I just wouldn't be as disappointed as Elaine is here. <laughs> She's saying it doesn't bother her, but clearly we're supposed to glean from her expression, her reaction that, yeah, it does mean something here. Like she's she's pretty disappointed. Personally, I could take it or leave it. All right, next we're at Kramer's car on the street. Jerry is appalled at everything Kramer bought. He's like, you're never going to be able to finish all of this. Kramer's like, well, no, these are all staples. A four pound can of Lindsay olives, 48 pack of Eggo waffles. Jerry picks up this ginormous can of tuna. Stark is Jerry. Most tuna don't make their cut. Kramer's just really excited. He thinks he's really got everything he needs from this price club. Kramer sees a friend walking down the street. His name is Clyde, and he greets him. And he introduces him to Jerry. He says he plays backup for John Germain's band. Jerry can't believe it. He's like, I was just talking about him. Tells Clyde that John and Elaine are pretty hot and heavy. Is that right? Clyde says. Kramer asks Clyde for some help with his purchases, but Clyde says, sorry, Kramer, I gotta watch the hands. My hands are my life. (laughs) I like the way he says that. And then he exits. Uh, Just real quick, I love this parallel. This is some really good writing. So Clyde coming through in this scene has a couple of purposes, I, I think. So first, of course, is so Jerry can do the whole hot and heavy exchange. But then also... And this hit me just in this rewatch that we're learning about a musician's instrument, not their literal instrument, but what they use on their body to play their instrument. So Clyde says, I can't risk injuring my hands. My hands are my life. So (laughs) it's, it's this illustration about how these musicians have to be so careful with whatever body part they use 
for their career, <laughs> which we will see, of course. I mean, I don't know why I'm saying this as if you guys don't know what happens at the end, but John Germain uses his mouth. So it's very clear what he has to be careful of <laughs> in order to successfully play the instrument. That's the basis of his career. Anyway, I just liked that they that they showed that parallel, Clyde's hands, and then later we see the impact on John's mouth. All right, next we're in the Costanza's house. Estelle enters and her dress is half zipped. She's like, George, can you help me zip up my dress? And he's like, yeah, yeah. He gets up slowly. She rushes him. Come on, come on. All right, all right. Let's not get into panic mode, <laughs> George says. He's like, we're never going to get to this night if we act like this. Well, I'm meeting your in-laws. I think I should look nice. Oh, in-laws. George is like nauseous at the term. And Frank's pretty proud of himself. Yeah, your old man can clean up pretty nice. But Estelle points out she really doesn't like his thin tie. They're wearing wide now. How do you know what they wear? <laughs> I have to really back away from the mic. I don't want to blow out your ears. But that is the only way to do a Frank Costanza impression. She says, go to any office building on 7th Avenue and tell me if anyone is wearing a thin tie like that. Go ahead. Get the hell out of here. Ooh, 7th Avenue. <laughs> I just have to say that part always gets me <laughs> like he's so bad at Estelle. He's telling his wife to get the hell out of here. But then he's like, oh, 7th Avenue. <laughs> like he just gets distracted <laughs> by the the clout of 7th Avenue. It's just, oh, my God. So such brilliant writing and the performance. And I have to point out here, I think Estelle and Frank might be a good example of a married couple who love each other but hate each other. Although we only really see the hate for each other. <laughs> Anyway, moving on. I got to move on for that. Okay. Uh, Estelle asks George about the tie and George is like, <sighs> he doesn't say this, but really he couldn't give a shit. Frank tells them that they need to stop at Schnitzer's to get a marble rye. It's out of our way. Why don't we just go to Lord's? It's right over there. Frank insists it needs to be Schnitzer's. They'll show these people something about taste. So Estelle and Frank exits. <laughs> George says, this is going to be fun. And slowly exits as well. Next, we're at Jerry's apartment. Jerry enters and Elaine is on the couch watching TV. Jerry says how he just met Clyde, who plays in John Germain's band. Yeah, what did he have to say? Elaine asks. Nothing. I just told him how you two were pretty hot and heavy. Elaine stops in her tracks. You said hot and heavy? She grabs a remote out of his hands and shuts off the TV. What did you do that for? Jerry's like, what? Elaine is so worried now Clyde is going to tell John that she thinks they're hot and heavy. I don't want him thinking we're hot and heavy if he's not hot and heavy. She's like, I'm trying to get a little squirrel to come over to me here. I don't want to make any big sudden movements. I'll scare him away. Jerry's like, well, maybe Clyde won't tell him. How do you know that? Jerry's like, oh, I fucked up. I should have helped Kramer with those packages. Oh, that face that Jerry makes, I just made it here in my closet studio. Love it. Super funny. All right, my take on this scene. So Elaine's reaction in this scene, it reminds me of the way George has acted several times about not wanting a woman he's dating to know he likes her, which has always seemed bizarre to me. But again, relationship success isn't what these people are known for. So this kind of neurotic way of thinking, that's what it's another crux of Seinfeld and these characters. And when I was younger, I remember not understanding this at all. What was the big deal here? I didn't get it. But again, as I've established, I was not even close to anything resembling dating at the time. And because like also my assumption back then with no experience was that if you were dating someone, the mutuality of attraction had been established and reciprocated. So what's the big deal if they hear <laughs> that you think that they're hot and heavy? I guess to me, it just didn't make any sense. But now as a much, much older woman and recognizing Elaine's less than stellar track record with men, as she says, she's running out of guys in this city. <laughs> this definitely makes a bit more sense. You know, when you really, really like someone, especially someone who you think is a bit out of your league, I think there definitely could be this type of insecurity. 
Um, you don't want to seem too needy or too eager. Now, I'm not saying that John Germain is out of her league, but I think that's, I'm just saying, I think that's what Elaine thinks here. Like she, as she says in the beginning, he's so cool. I can't believe I'm dating him. That establishes that she's, I don't usually date guys like this. He's super cool. I really like him. So I see this insecurity here. She doesn't want to be like that overly eager, clingy, you know, we're, we're, we've been told that women can be too clingy by the society and, and that's a turnoff for men or whatever. So even though men can be like that equally. So, you know, what? Well, not equality. Anyway, um, so <laughs> it totally makes sense to me now. It was baffling to me when I was younger. I'm like, but they're dating and they're having sex and he doesn't do a certain thing, which I don't understand. That's exactly how I talked when I was 17, you guys. <laughs> Maybe that's why I didn't date. Um, but anyway, I, I totally get it now. This is Elaine. Elaine has been trying to date and find a relationship for years that we see on this show. And yeah, like she doesn't want to fuck it up. And Jerry now opened his big mouth. And lastly, about the scene, I love JLD's performance. <laughs> that big sudden movements is always fun. All right, next we're in the hallway. Kramer is trying to bring up a bunch of his huge boxes and cases of drinks, food, all that stuff. And of course he falls and drops everything everywhere. Dennis, a neighbor, comes over to help him, and he asks Kramer if he would get his mail while he's out of town, and then he offers him to drive his handsome cab. It's just going to be sitting there. Kramer perks up. Drive the horse? Dennis says you can make up to $500 a day. I'll split it with you. And Kramer loves this. Giddy up. Quite literally. All right, next we're at the Ross's house. Everyone is eating at the dining table. George compliments the food to Mrs. Ross. <laughs> Mr. Ross is quick to point out, what are you telling her for? She didn't make it. Rowena did. Anyway, it's just a bunch of awkward interactions from Frank trying to understand what the hell they're eating to Estelle bringing up the library and Mrs. Ross saying he doesn't read anything. It's just super, super awkward. Frank brings it back to the chickens. He's trying to understand who has sex with the hen because there's a chicken and a rooster. George is like, can we talk about this another time? But you see my point? Something's missing. Something's missing, all right. Mr. Ross says, they're all chickens. The rooster has sex with all of them. Frank is shocked. That's perverse. George changes the subject to uh, Firestorm, the movie. Mr. Ross loved it, and he starts talking about one of the scenes. <laughs> Frank blows up. Oh, oh, I haven't seen it yet. It has nothing to do with the plot. Still, still, I like to go in fresh. George exhales. Oh, mother of God. Uh, that's something we say in this house a lot. <laughs> if anyone tries to spoil anything, we say, I like to go in fresh. All right, next we're at Central Park. It's just a quick scene of Kramer really enjoying this. He's giving some tourists some very inaccurate information about the park and how it used to be a training ground for northern armies to fight on grass. Oh, yeah. All right, next we're at the Jazz Club, Bradley's. John Germain is on stage, and he tells the audience he wants to play something he just wrote. It's uh, very fresh. Elaine walks into the club, and he sees her, and he says, It's called Hot and Heavy. Elaine slides down the wall in defeat. My take on this very short scene. Okay, here's where I'm... Can I, I am confused. Like I said in the last scene where she's mad at Jerry, I can I can understand that now. But in this scene, I... I don't know. He looks at like John Germain looks at her seductively and says that the song is called Hot and Heavy. I mean, he literally wrote a song about her, which is what she was fantasizing about in the first scene. So I guess I don't. This is where I really got confused when I was younger. I'm like, what? He wrote about it. <laughs> is he really going to write about something he's mad about? I mean, I guess people do that. But I don't know. I, I just this reaction of Elaine's was it still does confuse me. And I guess I'll just say it now. I say it pretty much <laughs> at some point in every episode, usually at the end. But this episode doesn't have enough Elaine. And this is where I would have liked another scene or maybe some more interaction or suspense about the consequences of Jerry's blurting out hot and heavy. I think we just needed some more context here. Because to me, again, I just think like he looks at her so like with his eyes. And he's like, it's called hot and heavy. <laughs> And she's like, oh, no. And I'm like, wait, wait, what? Isn't this, it's a good thing. Like Jerry says, I think it's a good thing. 
All right, next we're kind of bouncing between the Costanza's car and the Ross's house. It's the post-dinner discussion, which, by the way, isn't that so fun when you go like to a party or like a dinner or something? Like, I always love the rundown, like on the car ride home. <laughs> like, did you notice so and so? Like, oh my God, the food was gross or whatever. Like, anyway, it's one of my favorite things. George in the car. <laughs> sitting in the middle of the car, which I know is for the purposes of filming, but it always cracks me up. Like he looks like he's six. Anyway, George is so glad that's over. Stell was disappointed in Mrs. Ross, how she hits the sauce pretty hot. I didn't like that. Frank points out that they didn't even serve cake after the meal. So what, George says. Estelle agrees they're supposed to serve cake after a meal. I'm sorry, it's impolite. It's not impolite. It's stupid. That's what it is. Estelle agrees. You know, we're sitting there like idiots drinking coffee without a piece of cake. And George finds the marble rye in the back seat. Then we cut to the Rosses clearing the table. Mrs. Ross realizes, oh, no, I forgot to put that bread that they brought. And back to the car, Estelle says, we forgot to bring it in. No, Frank says he brought it in. They never put it out. Back to the Rosses, they can't find the bread. Mrs. Ross says, I put it over there. And Susan says, well, it's gone. Back to the car, George yells, you stole the bread? What do you mean stole? It's my bread. They didn't need it. Why should I leave it there? Because we brought it for them. Well, apparently it wasn't good enough for them to surf. Back to the Rosses, they're thinking, oh, maybe they took it back. Susan's like, oh, come on. Who would bring a bread and then take it back? Mr. Ross says, those people, that's who. I think they're sick. Back to the car, Estelle says how people take buses to get that rye. Well, maybe they forgot to put it out, George tries to defend them. No way, Frank thinks they didn't forget. It was deliberate. Deliberate, I tell you. And real quick, I just want to point out this. I just this reminds me of my parents. Like my parents would take something so small like this and like blow it up. And maybe it's all parents. I mean, the scene is written in this episode and I just feel like probably so many people could could relate to it. I mean, I will say the first time my in-laws met my parents. It wasn't great. My father-in-law, for whatever fucking reason, felt the need to blurt out that he thinks Indian food is very gross. And this was, I think, in the first 20 minutes of them meeting. And I'm like, what the, why? Why do you have to say that? And it's like, I could get that. That's a whole other podcast. Seriously, not just a podcast episode. My father in law could be a whole other podcast. But um, anyway, that was one thing where I had a George moment like, oh, mother of God. <sighs> it's a tough, it's a tough thing merging two families. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot of marriage talk on this, <laughs> on this episode. <laughs> I did not see that coming. All right, next we're in Monks. Jerry asks, so why did he take the bread back? George is like, why? Because he's off his rocker. That's why. And now because of that ride, George is going to have to keep them separated for the rest of his life. (laughs) Jerry's just, I love these moments where Jerry's just basking in his single life. (sighs) Sounds like a bad situation. (laughs) And George says, I'd like to replace that ride, you know, get another one. It has to be the same one from Schnitz's. And everyone's like, oh, there it is. And Jerry's like, well, just do that. But George can't do that without the Rosses out of the apartment. All right, just calm down. Let's think. Jerry suggests the handsome cab, you know, Kramer will take him out. George perks up. Well, it is their anniversary on Friday and they're meeting up anyway. Jerry's like, yeah, people love the handsome cab. Something about the clip, clop, clip, clop. <laughs> I think that's a great line. George asks, you think Kramer will do it? We cut to the next scene at Kramer's door and he says, of course he'll do it. He'll be happy to. He's like, all right, just be there at seven. And so they make all the arrangements. And while they're making all the arrangements, Kramer is going to town on this huge can of beefarino, which is supposed to be their knockoff of Chef Boyardee. Jerry's like, well, what the hell are you doing there? He says, I got 50 cans. He tells Jerry, and this just occurred to him, that he bought too much at the price club. He has no room for it. And George thinks of a little snag. Oh, shit. How am I going to get the ride into the apartment? Can't put it under his shirt. It's too big. Fine. Jerry says, I'll stop by the bakery. I'll, I'll come over right after Kramer leaves. And George is like, yes, this is all locking into place. Elaine enters and asks Kramer if that's his horse outside. Yeah, that's rusty. George is so excited. He wants to meet him. And then he also asks Elaine, you want to see the horsey? And he's met with a door slamming in his face. Elaine tells Jerry how he really did her in this time. First guy I like in a really long time. We're getting along. Everything is just great. 
I mean, all right, he doesn't do everything. And then you had to come along with your hot and your heavy. Jerry's like, you think Clyde told him? He wrote a song about it. Well, maybe it's a good thing. I agree, Jerry. No, it's not a good thing, Elaine says. It's a bad thing. It's a very bad thing. And she just unloads. Do you know what it's like to have no control in a relationship? You're sick to your stomach all the time. I mean, do you know what that's like? Jerry's like, no, but I've read articles and it doesn't sound good. (laughs) She gets in his face and says, something terrible is going to happen to you. It has to. No, Jerry says he's going to be just fine. But as far as you're concerned, he tells her just to talk to him tonight. Oh, she can't. He's got some record producers coming to his late show. I don't want to upset him. Oh, what the hell? I'll upset him. And Elaine exits. My take on this scene, it's a little bit meh. I mean, I'm just talking about the Elaine portion of the scene. Except for when she slams the door in George's face. I think that's hilarious. (laughs) And we say, want to see the horsey? Quite a bit in this house because my daughter takes horseback riding lessons. (laughs) And if we don't say the whole phrase, we just say, oh, it's the horsey. Anyway, I do like JLD's performance. Uh, I think she does a great job with the dialogue, but I just, the content is where I have an issue. The whole like overdramatic, something terrible is going to happen to you. It has to. Like it just doesn't do it for me. I do somewhat enjoy her asking if he knows what it's like to not have any power in a relationship, the sick to her stomach, and just him blowing it off. Like, I have no idea what that's like. Very on brand for his character, both characters, I guess. I mean, Jerry, yeah, really? Is he emotional about relationships? Never. I like her little quick turnaround at the end of the scene. I like the, oh, what the hell? I'll upset him. So the start and the end of the scene, or the Elaine portion of the scene, is good. But the middle, to me, is just meh. All right, next we're in the Ross's apartment. Mr. Ross is thanking George for setting up this whole handsome cab ride. He says, that's the least I could do. It's your anniversary. Anyway, uh, should we get downstairs? Eh, We got about 20 minutes. You seem nervous, George. Anything wrong? No, 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 no. He says he just gets a little bit nervous on the weekends, that's all. He asks for some water, and Mrs. Ross says, we have water. I don't think we have any bread, but we have water. Then we have a quick scene of Kramer (laughs) feeding Rusty a can of beef arino. Back to the Rosses. Now they're on the street and uh, it's a nice night for a ride. They haven't done anything romantic like this in years. So they're in a good mood. And then there's voiceover of George. He's panicked because it's 7.01. He can't believe his whole plan hinges on Kramer. What was he thinking? And then he hears a clip, clop, clip, clop. There he is on time as usual, he says. Next, we're at Schnitzer's Bakery. Jerry is waiting in line to get the rye. There's an old lady in front of him who gets called and she orders the last marble rye. And reminiscent to the babka, the lady behind the counter says, you're lucky, it's the last one. Oh shit, Jerry tries to explain to this old lady how he needs that rye. A person's entire future depends on it. And she says, sorry, you should have gotten here earlier. He even offers to pay double for it, but she pushes him. You're in my way. The actress in this scene is Frances Bay. In a later episode, we find out that her name is Mabel Choate. She's appeared in Twin Peaks, Billy Madison, and The Wedding Planner, among many other films and television shows. And I think she is absolutely perfect. I love her as this woman who will not give up her ride to Jerry. She is absolutely hilarious. All right, next we're at the Rosses. Kramer is being the most professional handsome cab driver. He tells them about the blankets, the hot cocoa, says to hop in. He'll give him a taste of old New York the way it once was. So it's all going really well in the beginning. They drive off and George is smiling and waving. But as soon as they're gone, he's looking around in a panic for Jerry. Next, we're on the street. Jerry is following the old lady, tells her he'll give her $50 for the rye. You can't turn that down. Oh, yeah, Watch me, she says. Well, he's had enough. He grabs her by the sleeve, pries the rye out of her hands. She's yelling for help. He tells her to shut up, you old bag, and runs off. Next, we're at the jazz club. Elaine is having the conversation with John. She apologizes. She knows he's got his important showcase later and that how he's worked so hard for this night. But she just had to tell him that she never told Jerry hot and heavy. I mean, who's hot and who's heavy? He stops her. He's pretty bummed. Elaine's surprised. Well, it turns out, uh, not surprised to me, John Germain was excited when Clyde told him that. Elaine says, you were? Absolutely. Oh, she's so relieved. 
And he says how he has a couple hours to kill before the next show. His place is just a few blocks away. Really? She says. You know what? I've been thinking about what we do. And uh, I'm uh, thinking of adding a new number to my repertoire. Elaine likes this. Oh, my take on the scene. I think I have a crush on John Germain, especially in this scene. I love how he assures her that he was excited about the hot and heavy. I think he should have been like, why the hell do you think I wrote a song about it, dumbass? (laughs) I would have added that line personally. I love the whole adding a new number to my repertoire line. It's so just these little touches with the dialogue is so good. And JLD's choice at the end is really fun. I mean, she's showing Elaine is excited, but it's a bit like, Okay, like that's never occurred to me. (laughs) Let's try it. (laughs) All right, next we're on the handsome cab ride. Uh, They're riding along. Rusty is farting, stinking up the whole uh, cab, and the Rosses are very bothered by it. I think it's the horse. How's everything? You need anything? Ugh, the smell is horrible. What do you feed this animal? Finally, they tell Kramer to turn around. We can't breathe back here. All right, next we're back in front of the Rosses townhouse. Jerry's about to walk across the street with the ride, but then Kramer turns the corner and George motions for Jerry to go away. So they arrive and (laughs) Kramer's trying to apologize as the Rosses are so mad, so upset. Thanks for nothing. Come on, George, let's go upstairs. When the Rosses go up and George is like, what the hell happened? The horse is gassy. It must have been the beefarino. You fed the horse beefarino? Well, I overbought. Mr. Ross calls for George again. He's got to go in. Jerry doesn't know what to do. And George just shrugs and goes into the townhouse. Then we have a quick scene at Bradley's, the jazz club. And the record producer is getting pretty impatient. And John Germain is late. And the guy says he's not going to wait around all night. All right, next we're at the Rosses. Jerry and Kramer are standing by the cab. He said he only gave Rusty one can of beefarino, but he really liked it. George calls up from the window of the townhouse and wants... <laughs> Jerry to try and throw it up since the Rosses are standing right by the door. Jerry can barely make it halfway up. He needs Rusty to move. I can't get any oxygen. Kramer doesn't want to get back on the horse. He tries again and again, but he cannot get near the window. And then George has an idea. Next, we're at the jazz club. Elaine and John enter, and he looks pretty dejected. She tells him, don't be silly. You were very good. You just don't have to try so hard. Good luck, honey. And John Germain's in a total daze and he heads up to the stage. My take on this scene, uh, there's not much to say, but we as the audience, we've been let in on something here. You know, John Germain looks very upset and uh, we can surmise that it was about the new number in the repertoire. All right, next we're back at the Rosses. Jerry's trying to hook the rye so that George can pull it up with a fishing rod, but it's not working so well. Your hook is too small. Finally, he gets it. So George gets it up there, finally gets it inside the Ross's place. And we have Susan and the Rosses staring at him in shock. And George just smiles, <laughs> schnitzes. And then the tag to the episode, we see John Germain trying to play at his show. He's got his lips around the sacks, but his mouth isn't working so well. It's all squealy. It's off key. <laughs> it just sounds awful. Everyone is horrified, including Elaine. She knows why his mouth isn't working so well. And she sneaks out of the club. Uh, My take on the tag, it's absolutely hilarious. So clever and funny. John's mouth has been overworked, clearly. And I think we can come to the conclusion that Elaine's vagina broke him and ruined his chances at getting a record deal. (laughs) That's unfair. It's not her vagina's fault. It's his fault for trying too hard. And I just can't help but wonder, and this might be a little bit graphic, but I'll go there. Do you think John was doing saxophone moves on her? I think he could have benefited from knowing Jerry's move. I mean, I don't think Jerry injures his mouth when he does the move. What's the theory here? I think someone who plays an instrument with their mouth for a living, I think they'd have some strong skills. But as Elaine alludes to before, it seems like he just tried too hard. So oh, poor John Germain. Like I said, I like John Germain. I think he's very good for Elaine. But um, I think it's over. It's definitely over after this. Obviously, she <laughs> slips out of the club. <laughs> I love that move, too. She's like, yeah, I'm, I'm out of here. All right, I am going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. Do you have an oral career? No, I don't mean working on people's mouths. I mean, your mouth is your livelihood. 
In other words, if your mouth doesn't work, you don't work. Those of us who rely on our mouths to pay the bills endure unrecognized challenges. If we bite our tongue, have a toothache, or lick too many lollipops, it could have some serious consequences. That's why I invented a revolutionary program to strengthen and protect your mouth. Hi, I'm Don Charmaine, creator of Oralobics, a workout regime for your mouth guaranteed to strengthen every oral muscle so that you can rest assured your kisser will always be in tip-top shape. Did you know that 48% of oral professionals feel that they miss out on crucial life experiences due to stress about injuring their mouths? And 79% say their relationships have either ended or suffered because they cannot orally satisfy their partners. When you join Oralobics for the low, low price of $49.99 a month, you will receive a full set of gum bells and tongue bands, along with access to dozens of online classes. And new to our gear shop, anatomically correct genitalia molds. These silicone crotches come in handy when paired with classes instructed by our resident expert, Kenny G. Kenny will assure the proper form to lick, suck, and blow safely. Take it from me, Kenny G didn't let the oral demands of his career get in the way of his intimate endeavors. Join Oralobics today by calling 555 Pump My Mouth. That's 555 Pump My Mouth. For a limited time with every subscription, you will receive an anatomically correct mold of Kenny G's mouth. Oralobics. Feel it in your mouth. And we're back. Some of the extras I wanted to highlight in the inside look, writer Kara Leifer talks about how at the time she was friends with Dave Cause, who was a famous saxophonist. Yes, there were famous saxophonists <laughs> in like the pop culture back then. And she just thought she, that her mind went there. She just said, with someone like that who plays the saxophone for a living, his mouth is very important to his career. So how would that affect other parts of his life? And so she she recognizes like, that's just how my mind works and how it was pretty out there at the time. But the network had no issue with it. She was prepared to have to change that storyline, but the network gave it the go ahead. In the notes about nothing, there were a few things. A voiceover line that was cut from the very first scene uh, Elaine, fantasizing about him writing a song about her, says, and now number one on the charts, Elaine. I thought that was cute. There was a deleted scene that they mentioned, but they didn't include in the deleted scenes extras. So apparently Elaine and John Germain are sitting and watching another band play and they're holding hands. Elaine starts to talk and John Germain shushes her and says he really wants to, quote, hear this cat blow. He then breaks the handhold and we hear Elaine's thoughts as she freaks out about that. Um, now, this is reminiscent of being shushed during Desperado in a later episode. So I think maybe they reserved that whole kind of thing for for later. But um, I think I don't think it's a perfect scene that they deleted, but I feel like that could have added some stakes in there for Elaine to be so nervous about screwing up this relationship. Like he's very kind of moody or whatever. But anyway, that was that was something that they didn't include. There was something else in the notes about nothing that I just wanted to mention because it's just it solidifies why JLD is amazing. They just mentioned all the awards she won playing Elaine. She won the Best Actress Emmy in 1996, Golden Globe in 1994 and back to back SAG Awards in 1997 and 1998. And of course, this doesn't compare to how many she <laughs> wins in the future for New Adventures of Old Christine and Veep. All right, now it's time to open Greg's sack lunch. Greg is our most dedicated contributor, and every week he sends us a sack full of thoughts. First in Greg's sack are his overall thoughts. He says, we are finally at the episode for which this podcast is named. Yay! This is a great all-around episode where all four have hilarious storylines going on. There are a ton of memorable moments, and Elaine sort of gets an isolated plot line here with the saxophone guy. Yes, thank you for recognizing Hot and Heavy in this episode, Greg. Uh, yeah, all around, really good episode. I I agree. All right, next in Greg's sack are his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. 
He says, the opening scene for this episode, which features solely Elaine of the four in a rare moment, is hilarious as it's basically Elaine's inner monologue coupled with her brilliant face acting. She really should be teaching courses in how to just move your face along with the mood of what is happening. I love that she envisions him writing a song about her beauty and then in the next scene scoffs when Jerry suggests that. It's true to life because everyone would think that if they started dating a songwriter, but you wouldn't want to seem like an egomaniac by telling anyone else that. I do feel bad that the sponge-worthy guy from a couple episodes is gone. He seemed like a good guy. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Elaine has moved on. (laughs) I'm sure something happened with Billy that just rubbed her the wrong way. You know what? I'm going to say he never trimmed his sideburns. I think that's what it was. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't love the writing in that first scene, but her face acting, I failed to mention, is still is still top notch. I mean, that that's never an issue. Even when the writing's not super strong, we can always rely on some stellar JLD face acting. And totally, totally true to life. I mean, I I did date and I'm now married to a songwriter. Now I guess a former songwriter. He doesn't do music anymore. And I I would think like every time they'd come out with a new song, I'm like really over interpreting the lyrics because my husband was the lyricist for the most part. He would write that he would write the lyrics of a lot of their songs. And (laughs) there was a song that came out with after he and I had been dating for a while and it was called numb and literally was the lyrics were, why do I feel so numb? And I was like, huh, is that about me? I hope not. I never actually asked him. <laughs> Maybe he just felt numb about me. I don't know. Well, he married me, so that's on him. Next in Greg Sack, he says, Elaine and Jerry's relationship is at full friend level in this scene as well. And I love that she reveals to him that John Germain won't go down on her, even though his whole career is about... <laughs> using his mouth and blowing. The writing here is impeccable as nothing is really clearly stated that that's what she's talking about, but you can read between the lines. Um, I couldn't until I was about 21. This show does this better than any other in history. Completely agree. I think you stated that perfectly. The innuendo there is always done well. Same in the contest episode. They never say masturbate, but they don't have to. And it's funnier if they don't say it. So completely agree, Greg. Next, Greg says, though not an Elaine scene, everything with George's parents is just perfection. From George having to zip up Estelle's blouse and screaming, let's not get into panic mode, to the conversations about the in-laws in the car. Poor Georgie boy having to deal with these people. (laughs) Susan's parents are perfectly cast as well. It's rare for Jason Alexander to be in scenes where he isn't getting the biggest laughs. And the scene at dinner with the four parents is one of those moments. You can cut the tension with a knife. And the back and forth showing the Costanzas and the Rosses discussing the rye afterwards. Kara Leifer wrote a perfect episode and these people acted it exquisitely. Totally. I apologize. I think I was trying to like kind of get through those scenes quickly because I, you know, I want to focus more on the Elaine stuff for obvious reasons. But Yeah, it cannot be stated. Thank you for saying this, Greg, because it is. It's all perfection, casting, writing, the tension, um, how George and you can tell Susan a little bit are so uncomfortable, like they're just trying to get through this night and it's portrayed very well. Next, Greg says, my favorite Elaine moment specifically is when she's explaining that she doesn't want John Germain thinking they're hot and heavy with her squirrel metaphor. The big sudden movements cracks me up. She plays this so extremely well completely agree. And you will hear in a minute or so how that's my favorite moment as well. Next in Greg Sack is his scene swap idea. He says, oh, no notes. This episode is brilliant. Kramer and the horse is probably the most expendable as usual, but the way they tied it into George's story worked so well that I wouldn't change it. Yes, I agree. Uh, I did cite that as my scene swap idea. It's not a full swap out, though, to your point. But yeah, the horse stuff is a little meh. And finally, in Greg's sack are his extra thoughts. He says, I feel like every sitcom in the 90s did a story about someone becoming a member of a bulk warehouse store. And Kramer's story here cracks me up. Specifically, the moment when Jerry says, look at this can of tuna and pulls out a comically gigantic can. This moment is one of my absolute favorites of the entire series. It is funny, that delivery and then seeing it. I mean, what the hell? Because he's like, he's just looking at that point. He's just looking into the trunk and we don't see anything. But the yeah, the can of tuna is hilarious. I remember one of the first one of those types of clubs to open was called Pace in the Metro Detroit area. And I think I, I think my parents were all over that. 
And then quickly we're like, we don't need this. <laughs> Even to this day, I look, I am a suburban mom and I am not a member of Costco because I'm just like, I don't need all this stuff. Like, I'm sure if I did the math, I could save all this money by getting some of these staples in bulk and all that shit. But I'm like, I just am not interested. Although sometimes I will admit I have Costco envy when I see or try products that are only available there from neighbors or friends or whatever. But I cannot handle that parking lot. Like it's just I, I have to drive by it to go to other places in my in my area and like fuck that. Like no, I, I just have no patience for that. I will stick to my smaller grocery stores. Thank you very much. All right, lastly, Greg says, I love that Jerry steals the rye from an old woman. These guys do so many despicable things during the series, and this one is actually one of those despicable things that I can see actually doing. <laughs> Shut up, you old bag. is so damn funny, it cracks me up. In my top Jerry moments ever, for sure. Oh, completely agree. I mean, it's so over the top and comical. Like, I, it's not cringy to me even today. I'm like, yeah, he's, he's mugging an old lady, grabs her sleeve, like... But this shut up, you old bag. It's like his voice kind of cracks. It's so funny. I mean, Jerry's voice is comical. They talk about it in the show. But yeah, I agree. One of the top Jerry moments for sure. Thank you so much, Greg, for contributing your thoughts once again. And now it's time to close Greg's sack lunch. All right, moving on to my favorite Elaine moments. Well, Greg was a spoiler. It's, it's the same exact big sudden movements. I love that part. A close second would be Elaine slamming the door in George's face. I just love that moment so much. All right. And my final notes for the episode. I really love this storyline for Elaine. It's interesting. It's relatable to some people for sure. It, it hits all of those Seinfeld buttons, but we just don't get enough of it. Big surprise. I know, but we just don't. I'm thinking we could have had an Elaine and Clyde scene. I think that could have been interesting where she maybe tries to get to him before he gets to John. Or maybe John Germain is a little more stoic after the hot and heavy reveal. Something to add to this very funny storyline already. I think we could have we could have used a little bit more, another scene. I would have swapped out the Kramer Price Club stuff to get more John Germain and Elaine. I actually feel Kramer could have been involved in Elaine's plot a little bit since he knew Clyde. Maybe he hears about the lack of, you know, cunnilingus and tries to help. I don't know, something. Um, the Beefarino thing is is funny. I mean, I laugh at it. I love the way he's like, Rusty, Rusty. <laughs> the scene with the Rosses in the handsome cab is hilarious. We say that a lot, too. I think it's the horse, especially when we go to our daughter's lessons and it's stinks to high heaven in that barn. I mean, it's just horse shit everywhere. <laughs> so a lot of times me and my husband will just have a moment. I think it's the horse. And I think that's all I can say about the rye. Please be sure to follow Hot and Heavy on social media. On Instagram, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. On TikTok, it's at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you'd like to email me, please do at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.